The title of this lecture is What You Will, Virtual Love in Twelfth Night. Many performances of Shakespeare's plays include virtual reality versions, some of which are linked to VR games. This is appropriate given that many of his plays toy with this idea, the relationship between reality and a simulation, one that makes us question the nature of that everyday reality. We'll think about this question with respect to the relationship between acting versus being, which we've been exploring in our study of the play thus far. Additionally, this concept of the theater and reality will help us answer some questions about Shakespeare's purpose in representing same-sex love. Let's start with a fairly easy example of a simulated reality, and that is Malvolio's relationship with Olivia. So let's have a closer look at Malvolio. Malvolio is an advocate of order, but he winds up advocating for disorder and being disordered himself. And how does he wind up this way? By following a script, the letter that he has found on the ground, placed there by the pranksters uh, who wanted to get one over on him. So he tells Olivia, uh, once she finds him all decked out in the clothing that he thinks she wants him to appear in, not black in my mind. So um, that would be a reference to melancholy, which was thought to be caused by an excess of black bile um, produced by the liver, according to Renaissance uh, medical ideas. So he says, not black in my mind, though yellow in my legs. It did come to his hands and command shall be executed. I think we do know the sweet Roman hand. So by Roman, um, he means a certain style of, of handwriting, uh, hence the word hand. So he's referring to this letter while talking to her and she didn't write it. So she has no idea what he's talking about. So let's take a closer look at their um, quote unquote relationship, like the relationship that might have been uh, the relationship that Malvolio is pursuing according to what he thinks is good intel. It is the very model of social decorum that he seeks to uphold in the dailiness of his job running Olivia's estate. This would prevent him from marrying Olivia. His job is to keep things running smoothly and in order uh, in her household. So that would not include her taking up with one of her servants, namely him. Malvolio's desire for social ascendancy is viewed as madness by the other characters. So um, some of them, uh, you know, pretend like he's mad just to stoke the flames a bit. Um, and others who aren't in on the gag, like think he's genuinely lost it. Um, we will hear more about Malvolio at the end of this lecture. Speaking of Olivia, let's turn now to look at some of her relationships. So Olivia thinks Malvolio is crazy because of his closing and his quoting from some mysterious letter. He is, of course, doing this because the letter has disclosed to him that A, she would enjoy the makeover, B, she secretly loves him, and C, she would like to help him exalt his social station. Let's turn now to thinking about Olivia and Cesario. So Olivia does not even know Cesario's name uh, in the first half of the play when she is um, so keen to have him. Uh, and she doesn't think, uh, doesn't seem to be taking the hint that he's not that into her. Um, the one thing that we know she knows about Cesario is that he's from um, a 
gentle slash noble social station. So she thinks about this at the end of Act One and is like, oh, yeah, I can tell that you're a member of the nobility from your carriage and your handsome looks and fine bearing and the way that you speak. Um, that's really the fuel for the crush that she has, um, you know, overlooking the fact that she doesn't even know this person's name. So when Cesario subtly suggests that uh, she is um, caught in a case of mistaken identity, like, you know, you don't really know what I'm about. Um, Olivia just leans into this misunderstanding. So um, Cesario says, I am not what I am. To which Olivia responds, I would that you were as I would have you be. So a really remarkable statement about love and one that makes us think, gee, um, how often, even when we're with somebody, are we imagining them as a more ideal version of themselves? So let's think about what Olivia is suggesting in this scene when she says, I would you were as I would have you be. Um, that human identity is created for the benefit of other people and perhaps even is shaped by other people and should be shaped by other people. So recall that uh, Olivia has accused Malvolio of being sick of self-love in the first act of the play. Uh, and shortly after this, Cesario says to her when they are engaged in that extended flirtation, when Cesario has come to court on the part of um, Duke Orsino, Cesario says, I see what you are. You are too proud. Olivia now knows what it is like to be pursued by someone you do not and cannot love. So the love uh, that Malvolio is pursuing toward Liv Olivia is taboo because of his inferior social status. So Olivia herself is pursuing an impossible love match with Cesario, um, whom she thinks is a perfect match because of Cesario's, Cesario's noble status. But um, however, she doesn't know that Cesario is really Viola, i.e. a woman, and she is engaged in same-sex love and recall what i just said uh, that olivia has expressed the desire um for cesario like just to be the way that i would want you to be well here malvolio uh in following all of the directions laid out in the letter really thinks he's following a recipe book to his mistress's heart so um, think about how those two scenarios square. Um, on the one hand, Malvolio is following what he thinks um, are those directions, albeit they're concocted by a group of pranksters. But um, if Olivia like could write uh, such a recipe and conjure up a lover from that recipe or stick Cesario in a blender and uh, shake them up and have them uh, mixed up with other ingredients and come out um, as she would have him be, uh, well, then that would suit Olivia just fine. So speaking of Viola, let's turn now to the twins, Viola and Sebastian, uh, with an eye to the question of whether they will, quote unquote, get back together. Will the siblings um, find each other in the world of this play? Let's have a closer look at the twins and the question of gender, in particular, um, exceeding your socially assigned gender role. Uh, Viola has to cross-dress to get a job, which ironically is what actors on the Shakespearean stage conventionally did, namely the men dressing to play female parts. So some audience members, including people in the present day, might rightly wonder, um, how does she pull this off? Um, does she have stereotypically, quote unquote, masculine features? Um, does she favor her brother a bit? Uh, we know that she's adopted the clothing um, that he conventionally wears. Uh, so Shakespeare might say, truly, 
a man can play with the parts of a lady, so why not? Um, you know, why would we have any doubt that she would be able to impersonate a man? That is exactly what is going on on the Shakespearean stage. So I know that doesn't actually answer the particular question of um, Viola and whom we would cast uh, to play that part, um, someone who could convincingly move between these different roles um, and not be, um, you know, picked off as as cross-dressing. Her brother Sebastian confides to Antonio that um, he takes after his mother and likes to cry. Um, we don't get a lot of footage on that idea in the text, but um, is he somehow a bit feminine? Uh, Duke Orsino has commented that um, Viola's feminine features and her high voice, which is like a young boy's, um, reminds him of Olivia. It seems um, feminine to him, and thus he hopes it will attract Olivia. Um, so are both of the twins, in being kind of feminine, uh, is Shakespeare making some kind of comment on the one sex model that uh, their general ground state leans more toward um, feminine and then becomes masculine um, at a different point down the road um, as the one sex model of development proposed. To get some perspective on these twins, let's uh, take a closer look at twins in Shakespeare's works um, as well as his personal life. Shakespeare's comedy of errors features two sets of identical twins. So you can imagine uh, why it is called Comedy of Errors. Love. All of the comedic action revolves around the twin confusion. So uh, for that, it's something like a, a sitcom a la that Three's Company show that used to be on in the 70s. So um, humor that revolves around really simple confusions um, that actually can get like, you know, stack them up. They can get pretty complicated. Fraternal twins like Viola and Sebastian would have been thought to be very strange in Shakespeare's time, um, especially when they were of different, quote unquote, biological sexes. Um, so let's unpack this, why they would have thought that that was um, strange. They would have even used the word um, marvelous. And there's a moment in the play where Viola uh is is dressed as Cesario and Olivia uh, interprets her as as male and so does Duke Orsino and she realizes now she's um, stuck with this identity she's created for herself and she says oh poor monster uh, so she doesn't mean necessarily like a Halloween monster uh, she means more like um, like a naturally occurring monster like something that's marvelous but you know with an edge of of you know, something scary or threatening or forbidden. And um, I don't think it's overstating it to say that fraternal twins in Shakespeare's time uh, would have been thought to be a bit, um, a bit strange, definitely marvelous, uh, perhaps even miraculous or monstrous. Uh, they had been born under the same stars. So if you think about a world that, um, doesn't necessarily laugh at astrology uh their astrological charts look almost the same the position of all of the planets which were thought to um govern a person's uh temperament as well as their physique um you know yet then they had developed differently and in some people's view um oppositely if you're going to take that view of the um that traditional view of the sexes as male and female being quote unquote opposites. Uh, so Shakespeare was fascinated with fraternal twins and we see in this play how it is really the crux of all of the action, the, the twin confusion, if you were to boil it all the way down. He himself was the father to fraternal twins. So Judith Shakespeare and Hamnet Shakespeare, both of them born in early 1585. Um, the son, Hamnet, died during a plague outbreak when he was just 11 years old. What you see above uh, at the top of this page is their baptism record at Holy Trinity Church in Coventry, England. And I'll just point out that we see H-A-M-N-E-T and Judith 
it says S-O-N-N-E. I know it doesn't look much like an S, uh, but that's how they sometimes formed it in this time and place. That's something like an ampersand. And then it says daughter to, uh, you can see the W, it looks like an M, but W-I-L-L-I-A. They would often abbreviate an M or an N at the end of a word with this little tilde thing on top of the vowel. And then you could see S H A K E. Um, yeah, Shakespeare himself during his life, you perhaps know, he spelled his name something like 14 different ways. Um, so I don't know if just saying Shakespeare kind of unintelligibly, uh, if that is some variant of his name or uh, the person writing this down, the scribe was kind of, you know, fallen into the crease of the book or something. But uh, indeed, we can see that those are his children baptized on February 2nd. So let's consider how twins are the key to Shakespeare's theory of identity. His question that I say is raised in this play, what makes me me? and not some other me running around out there. As I say here, twins raise the question, if I am a unique person, then why was there, from the very moment of my birth, a copy of me running around? Since these twins, Viola and Sebastian, are each also involved in romantic plots that we don't know quite yet how they work out, we'll find out in Act 5, we must wonder whether Shakespeare considered marriage as a you complete me moment in personal development, uh, wherein two entities, whether we think of it as two halves that have been separated, um, come together like we hope that these twins will because uh, they're both frightfully worried that the other has died in the shipwreck. The twins are the key to various confusions that um, get cleared up by the play's end. And I know that I'm waiting for them to get reunited, and it drives me a little bit crazy that they're both there in the same town, and for a good bit, the other does not know that their sibling is alive. Uh, so I know I, I feel kind of tense uh, until... Uh, you know, they make their way toward some kind of reunion or at least find out that the other is still alive. And, you know, why why does this tension exist? So uh, on the one reason, yeah, the audience wants the brother and sister to find each other um, because it's very sad circumstances under which they parted. Uh, but also Viola's transvestitism and thus her gender bending and taking on the role of a male um, – makes the audience nervous for the same-sex love relationships that it causes. Uh, so we think, gee, there's a male Viola running around in Illyria. You know, if only Olivia would, would find him. And, you know, he really is, like, the perfect match for her um, because he's of the quote-unquote appropriate gender. Let's put aside the issue of same-sex attraction for just a moment and consider what the twins coming together that we're, we're hoping will happen in this play. Uh, what does that say about the other couples who come together? Recall the definition of comedy. There is some kind of union wherein two become one. So comedy is often described as the successful resolution of the marriage plot. But this union, do we imagine when we're making this one thing out of two things that fit together perfectly, do we imagine opposites getting together or equals or two similar things? Uh, in my opinion, it's that difficult combo. I said in the last lecture that it's equals who come together, but who are also opposite. So a nice analogy is gloves that are the same. Um, they match, they're both red or whatever, but they are each opposite from each other. One is left and one is right. The way that the play is going, we can see that uh, the couple, the romantic couple is ideally comprised of social equals who are quote-unquote opposite, so a heteronormative match, 
male and female, but they are the same for their social rank. So since it's hard to say why the characters in Twelfth Night are attracted to each other, um, they fall in love at first sight and uh, they just jump into the action 60 miles an hour. The heart wants what the heart wants. Um, you know, Shakespeare is less interested in that process um, rather than having the lovers find each other and working beyond practical circumstances to have the relationship um, be successful. He's not all that interested in first and second coffee dates, as it were. Uh, but let me return now um, to the girl boy twin model and look ahead at the end of the play. So no real spoilers here. Uh, but I will draw on a little bit from Act 5. In Act 5, Scene 1, a comment is made on Viola and Sebastian. One of the characters says, An apple cleft in two is not more twin than these two creatures. Um, so what they mean is what I've been saying, that these two entities are... Um, opposites because they're the left and right half of an apple as it were but they you know cohere and come together as part of that same apple um you know equal a picture like the equal halves uh being put back together so let's think about how that washes at the end of the play um when we learn who winds up with whom Let's turn now to looking at Antonio, who, I'm not going to keep it a secret, is one of my favorite characters in the play. I'm not sure if this meme is still making the rounds, the good guy Greg meme, uh, but any good guy Greg meme reminds me of Antonio. And now that I've made that connection, everything Antonio does in the play, I can picture good guy Greg doing. In Act 2, Scene 1, we learn that Antonio has saved Sebastian, the male twin, from the shipwreck. Antonio says to him shortly uh, thereafter, If you will not murder me for my love, let me be your servant. So when, that's kind of some strong language there about the, the murdering. What does he mean? Uh, one translation, the way that sentence plays out uh, syntactically, I might say, if, if you don't think um, I'm too much of a busybody, if you don't think I'll get on your nerves, if we won't be in too close of quarters, if I'm not going to cramp your style, let me let me help you out. Um, because like Antonio is just supremely capable um, and helps out both of the twins as we as we see. So another reading would be that uh, their love or their relationship would be dangerous uh, because Antonio is attracted to Sebastian and same-sex love is taboo in this time and place. So um, that's a huge issue I'm going to tackle in a few minutes. A really critical scene with Antonio takes place in Act 3, Scene 4, where Antonio thinks he's saving Sebastian who's engrossed in a duel, but it's actually Viola disguised as Cesario. So in her male garb, she apparently looks just like her brother. So Antonio, it's very heartbreaking how betrayed by Sebastian, he feels um, the uh, authorities come to arrest him and he asks Sebastian, quote unquote Sebastian, for the purse of money that he had lent him. Um, and Viola has no idea what he's talking about. She salts his wounds by saying she does not even know him, which is in fact um, true. And she says to him, ungratefulness is the worst attribute of any person. So for you to accuse me of being ungrateful, um, you know, I don't know where you get off saying that to me. She's a little bit put out, but she also seems sympathetic. Um, in my humble opinion, Antonio's emotional pain at this moment is really the sanest and most identifiable feeling conveyed in the entire play that um, I can identify with it. I don't think it's frivolous the way some of the love relationships are, um, you're, and it feels really real 
um, not something that's included just to further a fun romantic comedic plot. Um, it really hits you in the guts, or at least it does me. So here is yet another favor that Antonio does for the twins. That is mentioning his rescue mission, how he plucked Sebastian out of the water. This youth that you see here, which is, of course, Viola, but he thinks it's Sebastian. I snatched one half out of the jaws of death. So it's like you were halfway to die in, but I, I saved you from that water. And of course, it's Sebastian he's rescued, not Viola. Um, but including Antonio in the play and having him speak this line at this exact moment, we can recognize a practical reason why um, he's there. Viola has made a little life for herself there in Illyria, so she hangs out with Duke Orsino uh, all of the time. He even says, I've told you things I've never told anybody before, and um, Olivia uh, likes spending time with um, with the Viola C Cesario character. Um, but then, so does Sebastian. So Sebastian's got this really good friend, too. That is Antonio. Um so we have like independent confirmation um, you know, on both twins that like, yeah, I can't tell them apart. Um, Viola's uh, circle you know, takes her to be a male, like she passes as male. And then um, Sebastian apparently looks so much like his sister that Antonio, um, you know, not knowing that he's not rescuing Sebastian, uh, you know, goes in uh, up to bat for Viola. Let's look a little bit more closely at the friendship um, and possible same-sex attraction that is shared between Antonio and Sebastian. Let's pick up with Sebastian in Act 4, Scene 3. He thinks he's woken up in a beer commercial. So let's take this apart. A rich, beautiful woman namely Olivia, has declared her love for him and is so happy to see him. Uh, here he is new in town. She showered him with presents and just made him feel so welcome. Uh, so simply put, he wonders if it's all too good to be true. He's got um, at least two such moments in the play. He thinks to himself, uh, this is the heir. That is the glorious sun. This pearl she gave me, I do feel it and see it. And though tis wonder that enwraps me thus, yet tis not madness. So he's kind of almost like when you wake up from a dream and you you tap the bed around you and you look around and make sure you're in a familiar place. Like he's kind of like, okay, pinch me. I think all of this is true. And um, I know I'm not crazy. He wonders aloud about um, Olivia. He's like, well... If she weren't crazy, and maybe that's a possibility, uh, I don't think she'd be able to govern her household as well as she does. Uh, so he definitely wonders this for a moment, whether all of the inhabitants of her house uh, are nuts. They seem to know him, and he has no idea uh, why that is. But he immediately wonders as he's immersed in this daydream and really lapping it up and saying this is a daydream that seems so crazy yet it's true the first thing he wants to do is is talk to antonio about it um where's antonio then i could not find him at the elephant so the elephant was the inn uh which was their uh, pre-designated uh, meeting place and um we must believe that antonio has been hauled away by the authorities when he was defending viola in the duel of course um as I said, he uh, is like something of an outlaw in Orsino's uh, land, and so that's why the authorities have sussed him out and taken him into custody. So let's consider Antonio and Sebastian's uh, bromance, and by that, um, I mean just that they are two male friends who who love each other. Um, that's how I use that term. Um, Everybody is falling in love in this play, like really irrationally and quickly, albeit not for Shakespeare's world. Um, you know, but uh, you know, the play only lasts a couple hours or so, and uh, we've got some relationships go their full trajectory in, in that short ambit of time. Um, 
one of my preferred readings of Antonio is like, quite frankly, he's not part of all of that. He's not part of that madness. He's like his own person. Uh, he's independent and uh, he hasn't signed on to this script. So recall that when Viola uh, visited uh, Olivia on Duke Orsino's behalf and she's got that prepared speech to woo Olivia with, um, you know, Antonio is not part of that you know, artificial world of, of courting, um, you know, not that he doesn't have romantic interests, but he's like, eh, you know, he's just so authentic. Um, and Shakespeare asks, you know, thus, what about love that doesn't depend on getting something in return? So, you know, even if you love somebody romantically, it's like, well, you're hoping for something else. You're hoping the relationship will go to the next level. You're hoping for a ring. You're hoping to get married and et cetera, et cetera. Like, what about a relationship that is just complete as it is the friendship between um, Antonio and Sebastian? Uh, and thus, we might look at their relationship as uh, posing a question. Is friendship in fact the more perfect form of love where uh you know sex and marriage and future plans all of that is not on the table um it's all about kind of you know that union that you're experiencing in the here and now um with someone who's quote unquote just a friend I would like to entertain the alternative reading um, in line with the theme of same-sex love in Twelfth Night, and that is um, Antonio's same-sex attraction uh, towards Sebastian. So Antonio is an outlaw in Illyria, and um, for my money, yeah, this might be a coded way of suggesting his same-sex love um, for Sebastian. Indeed. So let us continue and see um, how and why that might be. So homosexuality was illegal in England uh, because of the 1533 Buggery Act. So there were many such pieces of legislation um, throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Uh, this act is the one that was most relevant to Shakespeare's time. In fact, his contemporary, the playwright Christopher Marlowe, uh, was charged under this law and that there is a picture of Christopher Marlowe, um, such an interesting writer um, who died well before his well before his time. In the Middle Ages and afterwards, uh, same sex acts were among the many sins of the flesh. And um, this is actually the idea that I'm going to do the next deep dive on. Um, these sins were described in terms of their wastefulness. So it's a sexual act that isn't geared toward reproduction. Uh, so I'm going to explain this for a little while and then loop it back to Antonio to make sense of why he's an outlaw there in Illyria. So let's consider Antonio's particular reason for not wanting to run into the Duke there in Illyria. We know that uh, in the prequel to this story, prior to the Twelfth Night, their forces have clashed at sea and Antonio's crew stole from the Duke. So all of his crew paid back the spoils that they got, except for Antonio, which he, a fact that he confesses to Sebastian. So what does this have to do with possible same-sex attraction towards Sebastian? What does Antonio's material and monetary gain um, from the Duke and, you know, hence he's an outlaw. Like, how does this, you know, uh, inform us about his uh, his sexual disposition? In Dante's Inferno, so this is written um, in the early 14th century. Um, Dante was roughly a contemporary with our friend Boccaccio. Uh, sodomites and counterfeiters, uh, so people who forge money, fake money, they are located close by um, there in hell. So Dante has um, hell and purgatory in heaven all organized schematically. Hell is organized according to rings. And within those rings, there's certain sections. And so you are located very, very, very methodically according to the sins that you committed most often while on earth. 
So perhaps you've heard the expression queer is a $3 bill. Um, and I'm going to unpack some of the thinking that goes into that um, now retired expression. But, um, you know, even though uh, people hopefully don't use it today, um, you've, you've maybe maybe heard of it. What I have here is a couple of examples of $3 bills. So the one in the lower left-hand corner uh is one that uh, you know, celebrates being queer. And there we have even a, a unicorn there where normally a, one of the founding fathers would be. Um, I'm going to speak to the other example in, in just a second. It's thought that Dante was picking up on an entrenched cultural association between homosexuality and counterfeit money. So like counterfeiting money, homosexual acts don't reproduce in the right way uh so i don't know the full context for this three dollar bill that's up on the the top left but you can see it says in the center there uh it says seventh circle third ring and like yeah this clever person knows about dante's inferno it even says up here bank of inferno um the sodomites and the money counterfeiters are cheek by jowl there in that uh, portion of portion of hell. Um, for what it's worth, uh, and I, I think that this is significant. Christopher Marlowe, who uh, was in a lot of trouble with the people who ran the country, it's thought that he was a spy and that he was a double agent. He read a really led a really interesting life for the 27 years or so that he was on this earth. Um, so it's thought that perhaps the charges of homosexuality were just a smear in order to lay on more charges that the state had drummed up against him. Um, these included uh, hanging out with Catholics on the continent during a time when uh, the Protestant Reformation has happened. And so um, you know, the Catholics are... Uh, you know, public enemy number one over there in England. Here he is on the continent hanging out with them. Hmm. And, you know, then he's uh, probably crossed a few other people at the highest levels. Uh, he was uh, a familiar of, of Queen Elizabeth and the uh, intelligence work that he did for her. Um, scholars dispute the extent and nature of it, but he is linked with um, such jobs. And he also was charged with counterfeiting money in addition to um, the, the quote unquote crime of homosexuality. So, uh, you know, whether he did um, both of those things, I don't know. But in the um, cultural imagination, if you, we picture uh, you people drawing on drawing from the cultural imagination for crimes to ascribe to Marlowe because it's like, oh, we just want this guy to go to jail or we want him, uh, you know, dead and out of the picture. It's like, well, that's pretty telling that homosexuality and counterfeiting money were linked. Um, you probably know that he was killed in a bar brawl, uh, allegedly over the, the tab, but some people say they saw some secret agents in the bar that day. So who knows what happened to Christopher Marlowe? Uh, but here you have it. Uh, the link between, uh, homosexual acts and reproducing money in a either in an illegitimate way or uh you know forging it counterfeiting it um this isn't exactly what antonio does but from the duke's perspective he's gotten some kind of monetary gain a material gain that he should not have So given that same-sex love is such an important theme in Twelfth Night, we must wonder, like, to what degree was Shakespeare like, engaging with the culture of his time and making some kind of comment on it? Um, and so if you bear with me, I think it's a very complicated um, kind of comment. Many scholars agree that during the Middle Ages and Renaissance, homosexuality was described in terms of acts so either criminal acts that you um, commit by violating law or sinful acts uh, for which you would eventually be punished and wind up in hell uh, you, rather than a cohesive identity. So people aren't, quote unquote, out in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. They're more like boiled down to these um, these acts that in their minds deserve punishment. So 
for the sake of argument, in Shakespeare's culture, same-sex love like was not recognized. It was not legitimate. It might as well have not existed. It's not an official form of love. So to compare to our present day 21st century culture, um, like gay folks would not have been allowed to get married. They don't have that kind of legal status. Um, thus, the tension in the play um, surrounding uh, Olivia's love for Cesario, because the audience is tempted to wonder, um, does Olivia realize that Cesario is a woman and that this relationship is a no starter? Um, and if not, at what point will she realize this? So let's look at this question a little bit differently. Um, of course, people in Shakespeare's time had same sex relationships, even though they weren't allowed to be out and even though they weren't considered legitimate in the eyes of the state or uh, the church and other powers that be. Um, you And within the world of Shakespeare's plays, there on the stage, um, we do have several examples of same-sex love. So between Olivia and Viola, Orsino and Cesario, uh, who's you know, underneath the clothes is Viola, and then um, Sebastian and Antonio. So if we were to say, same-sex love was not legitimate or possible. Um, Shakespeare remarks like, well, yes, it is. Here in this world of the stage, which um, has the potential to create reality, you know, heck, look at these uh, look at these examples. Like, albeit they do have to get resolved into heteronormative relationships by the end of the play somehow, uh, but for that fleeting window of time, they do exist like lightning in a bottle. Many people who read uh, Twelfth Night really want to get down to brass tacks and they wonder, what was Shakespeare's take on same-sex love? Was he criticizing this culture that was so prohibitive and restrictive and unkind um, towards same-sex love? Uh, you know, that heteronormative love was the only one on the block. Um, you know, where did he weigh in on this issue? And uh, I'll say to ferret out the answer, the key to understanding it is Viola's cross-dressing, which um, in the world of this play is the main vehicle by which the same-sex attraction um, comes to exist. So let's follow this little trail. Male to female cross-dressing was of course a common practice on the Renaissance stage. And thus it was a familiar framework, a medium, a tool even, that Shakespeare worked with. So what happens in Twelfth Night? He takes this familiar practice, this familiar bit of technology, and imagines it working differently. Like what if um, we have a woman who cross-dresses for a job a job other than acting. It's not a man dressed like a woman on the stage. We're just going to change up this basic premise um, a little bit, albeit within the world of the stage. Um, for that, cross-dressing is a vehicle toward an alternative reality. If you are familiar with the science fiction show Black Mirror, you will um, understand this line of thinking, hopefully. So in this show, familiar technology, let's say social media, is used for a futuristic purpose. So in a famous episode called Be Right Back, uh, a woman's husband dies and she resurrects him by channeling all of his text messages and pictures and tweets um, into a, a, a robot of sorts. Um, and all of this uh, material, all of this data that she's harvested from social media becomes like his you know, neural center, his brain as it were. And uh, he's supposed to seem, you know, exactly like her, exactly like the husband that she, she knew and loved. Um, you know, which it's like, well, uh, that seems futuristic, you know, but if you like you stretch your imagination, you can you know, kind of see um, that that's not so far fetched. People um, have avatars 
with their social media. Um, they'll have little pictures of themselves. Um, and often they refer to their social media handles um, as themselves. So like they'll say, follow me on Twitter. It's like, well, it's not really you. It's your little uh, Twitter feed. Shakespeare's purpose in portraying same-sex love, um, I take it as something of a, a you know, what if scenario, um, kind of like this speculative fiction that we see in the science fiction show Black Mirror. What if there were a world similar to ours, yet with a few critical adjustments where same sex love was part of our everyday reality? So, what he's imagining uh, is an alternative reality, but one that is nascent within our current reality you know, so to answer the question about what you know, shakespeare thought about same-sex love um i don't know that he's got like or that we find this like yes or no answer or how would he vote on this you know legal proposition that is you know before the house of commons or parliament like i don't think we can consider it in um political and legal and cut and dry terms like i think he is um you know speculating you know what if it were part of our you know, social reality rather than just a um, a practice that transpires on the stage. And so lastly, this is going to seem like a little bit of a turn away from what I was just talking about. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about same-sex love in relationship to Festy, but I am going to pursue that line of inquiry about the relationship between, uh, you know, virtual reality and actual reality. So our friend Festy, what is he up to in Act 4? He dresses up as a priest, Sir Topas, while speaking to Malvolio in his cell, where Malvolio has been confined due to his madness. So why would a priest go visit him? Well, um, in addition to a, a culture that's not you know, sympathetic towards same-sex love, um, also not sympathetic toward mentally ill people. So um, Malvolio, of course, is not you know, mentally ill as the other characters you know, say uh, and think that he is. But nonetheless, he's been confined due to his madness. The priest is there per chance to exercise any demons that might exist in this quote unquote mad person. A critical staging question. Can Malvolio see Festi while he is talking to him and offering him counsel in the persona of Sir Topas? So here are two different ways of staging uh, that scene. So one has um, Malvolio under the stage and often he's depicted under the stage and he can see Festi. Another has him confined, uh, you know, whether under the stage or in a separate cell, um, and he can't see Festi. So here's my question. If Malvolio can only hear Festi, why does Festi dress up like the priest Sir Topas, which he does in any performance that I'm familiar with? Uh, I ask because in the very next scene after um, Sir Tobis has visited Malvolio in his cell, Olivia has made her love connection with Sebastian and she, uh, as quickly as possible, it would seem, has located a priest so that the two of them can get betrothed. Um, she says, blame not this haste of mine. If you mean well, now go with me and with this holy man. So that is the um, that is the priest. So here's my big question that I'll leave you with this week. Should we be suspicious of any marriages that come out of this comedy? So a comedy is defined as the successful resolution of the marriage plot. But in this comedy where we're playing very much with the relationship between pretend and reality, um, play acting and being, um, isn't it a little bit disconcerting that a fool can impersonate a priest so easily by donning a costume? So uh, isn't it alarming that um, the priest can suffer identity theft 
at the hands of um, Festy the clown. Uh, we suppose that yet yeah, this perhaps this very priest will perform uh, at least one marriage, maybe some more. Um, are those love relationships then going to be legit if something so um, holy and sacred as a uh, you know, clerical person performing this uh, this sacramental rite could in theory be just mimed by the play's fool. So on that note, I'll leave you and uh, see you later this week.